Is Trump going to get the trade deal that he wants? Is it the trade deal we want? What's going to happen next? As always, uh, to get answers to trade deal related questions, we go to the expert. Lori Wallach is the director of a Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. She's been involved in congressional level trade battles for many years, starting with the 1990s fight over NAFTA. She's uh, been advocating on this and organizing around this issue ever since. Now we have what some people are calling NAFTA 2.0. There have been some developments in that. So without any further ado, Lori Wallach, thanks for coming back on the program. Thank you. So we've had a couple big developments this week. The first one, and maybe more that I don't know about, but here's what I know about. Number one, it looks, if I uh, recall correctly, Mexico has uh, ratified this deal. Uh, the Senate has confirmed this deal that, um, there, that some of us are calling NAFTA 2.0. Uh, so that's right, right? It's going to have to go on now. Uh, they're waiting for us and the other signatories to either ratify or not? It's a little bit of a replay of something that happened a decade ago, which is the agreement that Donald Trump and Mexico and Canada signed at the end of last year. It's dead on arrival in the House of Representatives, which is controlled by a Democratic majority. That deal would not stop job outsourcing or the race to the bottom in wages. And it has special giveaways for big pharmaceutical corporations that would lock in high medicine prices. So the Democrats have been quite unified with Speaker Pelosi saying the only way this thing is getting a vote is if we take out the pharma stuff, we put in stronger environmental and labor standards and much stronger enforcement to stop the race to the bottom outsourcing. So the deal that Mexico's Senate voted on is not going to get a vote in the U.S. Congress. And this is actually what happened with George W. Bush and the last four trade agreements that ever got passed through the U.S. Congress, which is he signed a bunch of agreements. And then in 2006, the Democrats won a majority in the House. And he had to go back and renegotiate those agreements to take out big pharma goodies and put in labor and environmental standards. And actually, back then, similarly, both Peru and Colombia, who are two of the countries with whom these deals were signed in 2006 before the Democrats took over. They've, they rushed to vote for the deals that couldn't get through a Democratic House, and then they had to have a second vote once the agreements were changed. As far as what happens now, it's not clear if this White House will make the changes Democrats are demanding, but if there's going to be any revised NAFTA, it's not going to be the failed one Trump signed. The only thing that will go forward would be one that has these democratic improvements, and then Mexico will have to vote again. So uh, I'm just I'm, I'm going to try to bring our audience up to speed, myself up to speed, just to make sure everybody understands what, what's going on here. So Trump was, in some ways, perhaps uh, very smart when he ran for office, and that he ran for office against NAFTA and the other trade deals that have hurt the manufacturing areas of this country, I think my personal feeling, and I think probably yours, is that that helped him become president. He nominated somebody that were to be his trade representative who was, you know, kind of surprisingly okay, at least, and maybe better than okay. But he quickly turned into a boilerplate Republican on this issue, it seems to me. And it seems to me that this deal, uh, this renegotiated NAFTA, just so the people have context for all this, Lori, well, it, it seems to me like this the NAFTA that Mexico just ratified for whatever reason um, is still pretty lousy for the American worker, for workers in the other countries, and for the environment, for the American healthcare uh, consumer, and so on. So, just to be clear, we're not talking about losing a good good deal here, right? So here's, here's the situation. The guy that Trump appointed to be his trade minister, his USTR, is the only good cabinet member. And he agrees with a lot of the Democrats and the progressive critics on maybe 60% of what needed to be fixed in NAFTA. And so he achieved some good things. There definitely are some improvements. Those outrageous investor state corporate tribunals are removed from the deal. That's something progressives have fought for for 20 years. 
or the rules that required we export natural resources we wanted to conserve, those were taken out. Or the rules that required us to accept long haul, each country to accept long haul trucks that didn't meet our environmental or driver safety standards, that's out. Some rules that allowed China to sneak goods in through NAFTA that didn't meet any of the standards, those are out. And there is a good part of a labor chapter that could make a difference, but the labor and environmental standards are not strong enough and most importantly, none of it is enforceable in a way that could actually change the race to the bottom that turns middle class jobs in the US where workers get $30 an hour into sweatshop jobs where someone is hardworking and is smart in Mexico gets paid two bucks an hour to make that same car or to make that same tire or television set. So those environmental and labor standards need to be greatly strengthened and the enforcement needs to be totally redone Plus, one bad thing got stuck in, and that is new monopoly rights for the big pharmaceutical industry. They were allowed to rig these rules that would stop the competition, needed to bring down medicine prices. So we would lock in, Congress would be handcuffed for making the changes in the US, needed to bring down medicine prices, and we'd export our bad policies to Mexico and Canada. So the reason why Democrats and unions and public citizen where I work, the reason we're not saying just kill the thing is because they made some progress, but not enough progress to stop the existing ongoing damage and they added a bad thing. So the question is, can you take the deal that Trump signed, which is not okay, which would make things worse, <laughs> and can you take the pharma stuff out, put the labor and environmental standards in and get them enforceable so it makes a difference for people? That would be a deal though it's not the deal Trump negotiated, it would be the Democrats version, that would be worth having. And we don't know if that's gonna be possible, but that's the very moment we're in right now where the Democrats have said, hey, your job losing farmer price raising deal ain't getting a vote. If you so, wanna fix it, we'll consider it. So we're navigating, it seems to me, we're navigating tricky waters here because uh, you know if we, if we can push uh, Trump and his people Far enough, we'll get a, 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 a clearly better deal, but we could also kind of run aground and, and not have anything at all at the end of the day and be stuck with the deal we got now. So it seems to me, uh, you know, Trump might be very inclined at some point to say, well, I don't want to negotiate with you, Democrats, and so I'm just going to walk away from the whole thing. Is that a possibility? So what's very interesting is Trump as a candidate promised a bunch of things on trade, not a one of which he's been able to deliver. He promised he would immediately hit China with sanctions for violating, for manipulating their currency to get trade benefits. He has chosen not to do that each of the six times he could have. So the China trade deficit has increased enormously in each of the years he's been president. He promised he'd either renegotiate and replace NAFTA or just throw the old agreement out, get us out of NAFTA. And he has neither been able to renegotiate a deal that would actually make the difference, so it can't get through Congress, nor to date has he actually tried to get out. But his NAFTA deliverance possibility is much better than his China possibility. So there's enormous pressure on the president actually to make a deal to improve the agreement he signed, to make it the Democrats deal and to at least be able to deliver on some trade promise. And the problem is the thing he deliver on is really Democrats deal, it's not the sign deal he signed. So you're right, it's a little complicated for him, but at the same time, giving notice to get out of the deal would mainly penalize the farmers in the states that voted for Trump. Because the dirty little secret about NAFTA is, it's not mainly about cutting border taxes called tariffs. That was pretty much done globally through what's called the World Trade Organization. So there are not a lot of tariffs left. The one place there are tariffs where US exports would actually get clobbered if there was no NAFTA is beef, pork, poultry, and dairy. And with a handful of exceptions, those congressional districts and frankly those states are mainly states that voted for Trump. So he has very limited ability to withdraw from NAFTA without shooting himself in the foot politically which means he really is in a position where he kind of has to make a deal with the Democrats if he wants to get the thing approved. Well, that's very interesting. And again, we're talking with Lori Wallach, Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. So Lori, then it seems to me the ball is uh, very much in 
uh, Nancy Pelosi's court, right? Uh, that she's got to come back and say, this is what it'll take to make a deal. And my understanding is she's put some kind of working group together to do that. Is that correct? Sure is. So the speaker has been very strong in saying to the White House, you know, there's a path to getting to yes on this agreement, but it's not getting a vote unless the labor and environmental standards in their enforcement are significantly strengthened. So it actually would stop NAFTA's ongoing race to the bottom outsourcing and downward pressure on wages. She's also made very clear that the big pharma goodies have to come out and she's made clear those are changes that have to happen to the text. She's not going for side agreements. She's not going for implementing bills. It's for real. So the administration, which signed the deal at the end of November last year, for all the months between now and then, six plus months, has said, we're not changing a single comma. And then about three weeks ago, they started to hint about the fact that they were recognizing this thing's not getting a vote in the Democratic House unless they make some improvements. So since then, there was a big meeting with the speaker and the trade ambassador. And since then, the speaker has set up a working group. You're exactly right. And that working group has been tasked to represent the rest of the Democratic House caucus in basically working with the trade representative to get those necessary changes that would make it a deal that would deserve a vote. And their standard is pretty clear. It has to stop the ongoing damage as far as outsourcing and race to the bomb wages and the big pharma handcuffs that would make it basically impossible to lower medicine prices, which the Democrats promise they do. That stuff has to go. And now it remains to be seen how the administration will react. All right. Well, that's fascinating stuff. And I want to ask you well, before we, uh, you know, before we conclude, Lori, I could be wrong about this. But I, I'm wondering if the Democrats have improved at all on trade. And the reason why I ask that is that you've, you've mentioned some strong positions that the Democrats are taking on labor rights and on, um, on protections for pharmaceutical consumers and so on. And uh, it seems to me that in previous deals, Democrats have insisted, for example, that there be language about labor rights, but once in office, we're not, uh, or while in office, uh, particularly in the White House, we're not all that stringent about enforcing those rights or some of the other provisions. I mean, uh, I also recall President Obama certifying, uh, I think it was Malaysia as an acceptable country for labor practices when it had child labor border, bordering on slavery in that country. So I guess I'm, but listening now, it seems A, like it's, unquestionably, and I'm not not questioning this, it's a great thing that we have a Democratic House now to, to put the brakes on this thing and demand better. But B, it seems as if the Democrats are maybe as a result of grassroots pressure or whatever, being better on trade uh, than they've been in the past. Am I right? Are they being better? So the situation is there's always been an extremely upsetting split between where most of the congressional Democrats are, particularly in the House of Representatives, where they face the accountability of elections every two years and actually have to represent more closely what their voters think, and the presidential wing. So folks will remember that it was President Clinton who got us into NAFTA and pushed China's WTO, World Trade Organization, admission that wiped out two million manufacturing jobs. Folks who remember that was President Obama who pushed the TPP, which was basically NAFTA on steroids. Instead of rolling back the corporate tribunals, he expanded them. Instead of raising the amount of content that would have to be in the agreement, he lowered it relative to NAFTA. It was very upsetting, but here's the thing. The vast majority of congressional Democrats, when it came to their own presidents, marquee trade agreement that he spent the last year and a half of his presidency trying to pass, the congressional Democrats also said, eh, not going to support it. And for basically the same issues as the NAFTA. Now, ironically, the revised NAFTA's labor standards are a little bit better than Obama's TPP. The environment chapter is very similar. And those medicine, IP, big pharma goodies are even worse than TPP. So the Democrats in the Congress are being pretty consistent, honestly. They are basically saying we wouldn't take the Democratic president's TPP and we're not going to take the Republican president's NAFTA 
2.0, we really actually have in mind what kind of trade agreement would be good for people on the planet. And regardless of who is president, we're not going to go for a trade agreement until that's met. That said, there are worrying signs that the presidential wing of the Democratic Party remain enormously clueless about how you started is exactly right. Trump would not be in the White House, but for riding his way through Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania on the trade issue. Those were small margins. The difference that flipped were basically working class voters. It was working class voters in the cities, people of color who had no enthusiasm to come out and vote, lost a lot of votes, for instance, in my home state of Wisconsin, in Milwaukee and Racine relative to the two times bigger numbers of people voted for Obama. And in that set of four counties right up along the Mississippi River in Minnesota, which are working class uh, factory communities and also farmers, those were Obama, Obama counties that flipped to Trump. That is how Trump got to the White House. And yet, despite that, despite knowing that doubling down and more of the same on trade is the best way to give Trump a second term through the same route he got a first term, you do have some Democratic presidential candidates, one of whom was Obama's vice president, pushing TPP, who continues to bemoan we're not in TPP, something Democratic base voters reject, who continues to say his vote for NAFTA was the right thing, and who thinks we don't really have a China trade problem. Happily, a bunch of the other candidates see that that is both bad policy and losing politics. So you have Warren and you have Sanders and you have Ryan and you have Gillibrand and many others who have been very clear we need a new approach. And very soon the Citizens Trade Campaign, which is the national coalition of unions, environmental, consumer, family, farm and faith groups will have on its website questionnaires answered by all of the candidates as vis-a-vis what they think should happen with NAFTA. And when it comes to that, Actually, all the Democratic candidates have said the pharma stuff has to come out, the labor and environmental stuff and enforcement has to improve, including Biden. So it sounds like uh, as if things weren't interesting enough, we, as we enter the heat of the uh, presidential campaign, they're going to get even more interesting. So uh, where can people go, Lori Wallach, uh, to find out more about what you guys are doing and maybe more about this uh, trade campaign you guys are putting together? together. So there are two great resources. If you want to just quick and dirty, get onto a list so you can be kept up to date on when actions are important, when developments are happening. The action list, the campaign website is www.replacenafta.org. One word, replacenafta.org. If you want to dig a little bit deeper into what is in the new agreement, what was in the old agreement, how many jobs were lost in your community to NAFTA certified by the government, please go to tradewatch.org. That's tradewatch.org. You'll find there the NAFTA campaign and you'll find the Trade Data Center. At the Trade Data Center, you can find out how your member of Congress votes on trade. You can search for the jobs that were lost to NAFTA or to China trade. You can look at what the total impact of these agreements has been state by state, a ton of data. And then there are action ideas for how you can get involved because right now, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna see how this NAFTA fight plays out and we're all gonna have to be involved if we have any chance of it going the right way. All right, well, as always, extremely informative, extremely helpful, Lori Wallach, again, Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. Uh, Very interesting update and thanks for all your great work in this area, Lori, and thanks as always for coming on the program. Thank you for inviting me and for keeping your viewers engaged. Really important set of issues, and you've been a star making sure people know about it.